Well, it's really good to be here, and, and thank you for having me. Um, I have to admit there is a part of me that has been a little intimidated about stepping into the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library. Um, a part of me that has always felt a little insecure about thinking everybody's going to be in there talking about Heidegger, talking about <laughs> Hegel's dialectic, and I'm going to feel like a dummy, right? And that part of me, and the reason I'm really emphasizing this is because I have parts of me. I'm a multiplicity. The Ian you see sitting in front of you, there's a lot of Ians in here. And some of those Ians came into existence when my father said, you shouldn't be a philosophy major. You need to go study chemistry. Why are you studying this stuff? It's not going to get you anywhere in life. So that challenging experience with my own father developed into that part that I'm aware of when I drive by our VML. And I feel that insecurity and that wounding that happened that I still am working with with my own father. I'm aware of is still present in me, that part of me. It's not all of Ian, but it's a part. And um, so it's really good to be here. And um, I, this has been a dream of mine for the last decade to be doing psychedelic medicine with people. Um, I've been really following, you know, the research carefully, the MAPS MDMA trials that they're doing in post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and it's interesting that Bill Kouth is here because I've involved, been involved with MKP since 2008 and was in a men's group um, and then got into another men's group. And then that men's group led me to a third men's group, a psychedelic men's group, with some other physicians, some educators, acupuncturists. And the five of us decided that we were going to start a psychedelic group based on the men's work that, that MKP, that the New Warriors introduced me to, based on vulnerability. As Brene Brown says, vulnerability is the pathway to healing. What I'm afraid to let you know about me is, and then going into that from there, very much a restraint release kind of approach to psychology, as opposed to pushing away, as opposed to repressing these parts of me that I don't want you to see, that I don't want to see myself. How can I stand present with those parts, with those aspects of this Ian-ness? and understand how did they come into existence? Why are they there? What are they trying to teach me? What are they trying, what kind of information are they trying to give me? And this deep belief that all challenging, traumatic, difficult experiences hold within them a seed of healing. If we can feel it and really feel it, we can heal it. There's no other way, ultimately, to get to the kind of healing that we're talking about with psychedelic medicine and that I think that we're practicing up at Hidden Springs right now. I mean, I'm still pinching myself that this is actually, that all of this is actually happening right now. That psilocybin's gonna come online June 2023, likely. There are some hurdles. You know, the Jackson County commissioners are thinking about opting out right now, and I think, you know, it's primarily fear-based, you know, I think there's a lack of education. I think they've been burned a little bit by the cannabis thing. So there's a group that's organizing that is going to talk with the commissioners. Um, and I mean, in Jackson County, it only passed 51.3%, so it wasn't like a slam dunk in Jackson County. So there is some resistance to psilocybin being used um, for healing. But hopefully next June, you know, it's, it's going to be a big, it's going to be a big month because hopefully MDMA will be rescheduled from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. And, you know, MAPS is really busy training, 
doctors and therapists, nurses, nurse practitioners, to be able to offer that um, for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so this group, so this group of five, this psychedelic group, I just want to say a little bit about it because it's really changed my life. It's been seven and a half years that we've been meeting monthly and just having you know, regular sober meetings, men's group meetings, um, very shadow work oriented. Um, and then three times a year, maybe on both equinoxes and a solstice, we'll get together, we'll spend a day together and explore consciousness the five of us. And we know each other quite well, so we feel quite comfortable. We're able to drop into some vulnerability with each other. We know each other's triggers. We know each other's strengths. We know each other quite well. And to drop into that space with others has been incredibly healing and informative and a real kind of um, exploratory container for us to explore consciousness with each other in a supportive, loving space. So right now, what is legal is ketamine, you know, until next year. Um, and it's interesting, I, when I, I was really eager to open up this psychedelic assisted therapy uh, clinic, which um, is happening at Hidden Springs, right, right across the street here beautiful setting, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about, you know, set and setting, which are really important psychedelic medicine. But I, I, initially I thought that ketamine was going to kind of be a placeholder, right, for psilocybin and for MDMA and for hopefully LSD at some point down the road. I have developed an incredible appreciation for what ketamine can bring and what it can do. And it's got quite a range. It's not just a psychedelic. Um, it's also, you know, there's the term psycholytic, uh, which means it brings down our ego defenses, right? Similar to MDMA, which really does this in spades, right? The, the self-love, the self-acceptance, the self-forgiveness that come on quite strongly with MDMA that's so important in being able to really look fully straight in the eye at our shadow, right? Our ego defenses that come up when we've been wounded, when we've been traumatized, um, when we've faced really challenging experiences, you know, we often walk around with this cumbersome armor trying to defend ourselves. It gets kind of clunky after a while. We're trying to protect ourselves. We don't want to get hurt. We don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to open up. And at some point, that armor really wears out its welcome and becomes more of a hindrance than an asset. And so the psycholytic concept is that the lytic, the lysis, the breaking through those ego defenses, that vulnerability can come up. And when it's held in a container, which the psychotherapist I work with, Martha McCord, and I bringing presence bringing a very non-judgmental space, bringing a deeply compassionate space. That combination of presence and compassion and non-judgment with the vulnerability, that combination has incredible potential for healing. It has incredible potential for there to reestablish secure attachment because that's really what this is about. It's about coming into feeling safe to be in relationship with yourself and with others, with your spouse, with parents, with your siblings, with friends, with your community. How can we feel safe and totally free? And, and that comes from a place of self-acceptance, from self-love, of radical self-compassion like Tara Brock talks about. So ketamine is really unique. Um, it's been around since 1962. It's on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines, which is based on safety and efficacy. It's used frequently with pediatric surgeries, so it's used with children all the time at much higher doses than what I'm giving. Because at those doses, we're talking about anesthesia, and there's no psychotherapeutic 
value or benefit of anesthetizing somebody, <laughs> obviously. Dose really matters with ketamine. So at lower doses, you're going to get more of a psycholytic effect, more of an empathogenic effect. So like with MDMA, that word empathogenic, em emp empathy, gen, generating, generating empathy, that self-love, that self-compassion, that self-acceptance, that self-forgiveness that I'm talking about, that's the empathogenic effect that ketamine can have. Um, MDMA has that as well. Ketamine is also unique in that it works on the NMDA receptors, which are glutamate activated. It's involved with learning. So it's different from serotonin, it's different from dopamine, it's different from epinephrine and norepinephrine, it's different than the other neurotransmitters. It's unique, glutamate's unique, MDMA receptors are unique. But it's how we learn. And one of the ways that it does this is through uh, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is being studied extensively right now for cognitive decline. Because BDNF is one of the primary drivers with neuroplasticity. So how to change the mind, like Michael Pollan's talking about. This is both a metaphor and it's a literal neurochemical kind of thing. Ketamine and psilocybin are both activating neuroplasticity in the brain, meaning we're creating new neural pathways. Right? We're, in, we're creating new ways of seeing the world, new ways of interacting with the world, and rewriting the narrative. And so this is significant in that memory reconsolidation, which is the psychological term for when someone has had a, a traumatic experience. When we call that experience to mind, be it through a flashback with PTSD, there's an opportunity to look at that experience and potentially rewire the meaning of that experience. It doesn't change the fact that the experience happened, but our perception of it and how much it's integrated and how much we're triggered by it can be changed. And this is the whole premise that the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is working on right now, that the MDMA shuts down that, re that physiologic response that's triggered when a flashback happens with a, a, a person with PTSD. When that flashback happens and you're re-triggered and we feel like we're right back at that moment of the trauma, if that physiologic response can be shut down a little bit, in this case with MDMA, there's a massive oxytocin release, so it's both very pro-social and it's relationally engaged. But if that, and fear is diminished, the amygdala is shut down, so fear is diminished. And so when there's no physiologic response to revisiting that trauma, people are able to look at it squarely and hopefully integrate it then at that point. Hopefully find, come to some peace with it. You know, last in May, I attended the, um, the MAPS MDMA training uh, in Colorado. Uh, we were at the Shambhala, at Trunkpa's retreat center in northern Colorado. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that because, you know, there's an interesting history with Trunkpa, obviously, very, very interesting history. Um, but it relates to what I'm talking about. Now, this, you know, the punchline is that gurus have parts too. Yes. Right? And I think that in the West, in particular, we look at gurus and think about them as perfect individuals, walking Buddhas, but they have parts, and they're humans, and that's part of the beauty of it, and the tragedy of it, both, right? Especially in Trungpa's case, and his son's case, unfortunately. Um, but again, you know, that belief that even the rupture, the trauma, if it's looked at, if it can be talked about, if the underlying root cause that drove that can be discussed and transparent about, it can be healed in any community. And, and uh, even the, the Shambhala, even the, that community, I think, can heal. Um, so BDNF, 
you know, part of what's going on with psychedelic medicine and the, uh, the biochemical effect is that our default mode network is turned off for a little while. Let me see if I, I have a slide coming up here in a minute. But the default mode network is, is talked about a lot because it's, it's that kind of when we're just sort of in a resting state. It's that ruminative, mi ruminative mind, that monkey mind that's bouncing around. Usually there's, you know, a self-critic in there. Usually there's, you know, narratives that are from our past that are in there somewhere. You know, but when that typical way, and, and, you know, the brain isn't completely networked when we're in the default mode network. We're only using a few channels. We're not using the whole brain, you know, when we're in the default mode network. And so it's, it, it really is a limited state of, it's a narrowed state of consciousness. Okay. So I don't want to talk too much about the individual medicines. I did want to talk a little bit about ketamine because that's what we're using currently. But each of these medicines is quite different. And each of the medicines has you know, psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine, LSD, mescaline. All of these, all of these medicines have slightly different effects. And it's the context, it's how you're using the medicine which is so important. And that's where, you know, Timothy Leary, who, you know, probably set us back, you know, a few decades in this. I think that he, in part, was responsible for Nixon, you know, scheduling everything, Schedule One. So it was a double edge, that Timothy Leary. But I really think that his set and setting holds true. It is, you know, the set is what is inside of us. What are we bringing to the experience? What do we have for breakfast that morning? What are we feeling when we go into a psychedelic state? What kind of, of baggage, family history, family of origin history, what are we bringing to the experience? And the setting is the context, everything around us. You know, is there a therapist present? Is, is the, the physical setting, the music, you know, again, I feel so blessed to be up at Hidden Springs because Hidden Springs is both a metaphor and a physical, literal Hidden Springs. There are Hidden Springs up there, but also it's this Hidden Spring that's within each of us, this Hidden Spring of resource, this Hidden Spring in IFS lingo of self, capital S self, that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. So it's really how are you using the medicine. It's not what medicine you're taking. It's that combination of those two. So how did I get here? I'm a naturopath. Um, being the firstborn son of a medical doctor, <laughs> um, my father was not happy that I, when I went into naturopathy, much less wanted to study homeopathy. I, I couldn't resist this holistic approach to medicine. I couldn't resist this concept of vitalism. This concept that each of us has an innate healing capacity, an innate doctor that is far, far wiser than any doctor you'll ever meet. That we have that inner doctor within us all the time, constantly moving us towards homeostasis, although I don't really like the word homeostasis because there's absolutely nothing static about human physiology or the human system. We're constantly in a dynamic state of movement. Blood pressure, endocrine system, heartbeat, everything is responding to our context and what's around us moment to moment. It never stops. So there's nothing really static about it, but we're constantly moving towards healing all the time, up to our last breath. So, you know, Samuel Hahnemann, 250 years ago, German physician, spoke 13 languages, um, and an Aries, <laughs> and uh, really rebelled against the conventional medical system at that time, and almost, you know, was a polarity kind of thing. He, you know, here's what they're doing with the bloodletting, with the leeches, all of that. 
um, operation successful patient dead <laughs> kind of medicine, right? And he said, wait a minute. Um, what about cure? What about healing? What is healing? Why are we only palliating? And on some level, the same argument can be made today about our conventional medical system. I don't think we're orienting towards healing. I don't think we're orienting towards cure. We're orienting towards palliation, which really ultimately serves big pharma, right? Because if you can give a drug, make the symptoms go away for four, six, eight hours until the liver metabolizes it and it's peed out or pooped out, take another medicine, another four to six hours of relief, take another medicine, that works for some, but it never heals anyone. It palliates for a short period of time, but it never heals. So here's Hahnemann, the phys physician's highest calling, his only calling is to make the sick healthy, to cure, as it is termed. What is cure? The highest ideal of cure is the rapid, gentle, and permanent restoration of health. I am aiming for nothing less than that. And this is what psychedelic medicine can move us towards. This is going to be an enormous disruptor to psychiatry and psychology. It already is, right? And we are talking about healing. We're not talking about palliation anymore when we talk about psychedelic medicine. So back to Hahnemann, the physician gives him, this is, this is palliative medicine. This is, um, you know, conventional medicine. The physician gives a medicine that is known to bring forth the exact opposite of the disease symptom to be allayed from which he can accordingly ex uh, expect the speediest palliative relief. Contraria contraris, opium, any kind of painkiller, antidepressants, anxiolytic, anti-anxiety drugs, Ativan, Xanax, um, Valium, um, you know, this is his language from 250 years ago, purgatives for constipation, cold water for burns, and wine for debilitation. <laughs> so Sonneman says this is a very faulty, merely symptomatic treatment, wherein only a single symptom, thus only a small part of the whole, is one-sidedly provided. It is evident that aid for the totality of disease, which is alone what the patient desires, is not to be expected. Right? And so this is the other um, aspect of homeopathy that I bring with me into psychedelic medicine. In aphorism number nine, Hahnemann says, in the healthy human state, the life force that enlivens the material organism as dynamis governs without restriction and keeps all parts of the organism in admirable, harmonious, vital operation as regards both feeling and function so that our indwelling rational spirit can freely avail itself of this living, healthy instrument for the higher purposes of our existence. Pretty lofty, yeah. right? I'm talking about healing, though. I'm talking about cure. I'm talking about what is this precious life that is short that we have right now? What are we doing here? What is meaningful? What is valuable about our lives? And how do we find that meaning and value? And how do we orient ourselves towards meaning and value all the time. How do we orient towards that? All right, here's a longer quote that I'm going to, um, I think I, I am going to read this just because it's so beautiful. This is, this is from a Tibetan Buddhist in Ann Arbor, Michigan, who just happens to be the son of Jean Kirkpatrick, who was the neocon under Reagan, who was working for the UN. He's a fantastic teacher. He's a poet as well. It's not stress that drains life from us. That is a ruse designed to sell the accoutrement of an endless, fruitless, and failing effort at stress reduction. The problem is not stress, but meaninglessness. And what is deadly is the combination of the two, stressful meaninglessness and meaningless stress. We are a culture built around consumption rooted in impossibilities, a life free from stress, a life free from struggle. We are a culture of the weekend, retirement, the holiday, time off, entertainment, stress reduction. We fixate on solving the problem of meaninglessness, ache with distractions and momentary comforts. 
In this endeavor, we trade joy for fun, nourishment for entertainment, meaning for the fretful attempt at a stress-free living. Because we have lost touch culturally with what is meaningful, a life centered on the hard work and the struggle inherent in actualizing and expressing Plato here, the true, the beautiful, and the good, we seek, to, uh, we seek a distraction from ourselves, an ever more aggressive problem. In truth, human beings thrive on challenge. The creative response to challenge, the hard work of a noble life, work life, good life, with its creative demands, and the hard work of encountering and overcoming the obstacles to wisdom, realization, and the benefit of beings is tiring, but also enabling, enriching, nourishing, and directly connects mm -hmm. us to the inherent meaningfulness of reality. So, he, he look up his poetry. It's like, it goes straight to the heart. I love his work. And obviously this ties in with Viktor Frankl's work, right? We're talking about meaning making. And that is, you know, in psychedelic medicine, there is a meaning making aspect to this work. How can, not in a cognitive prefrontal cortex discursive sense, but how in a felt sense do we get to what is most meaningful, what is most valuable in our lives, and how do we orient towards that with full force? In some way, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning, such as the meaning of a sacrifice. And I... And the classic example of this is childbirth. You know, I, I, I had the great honor to watch my wife <laughs> do home births, two of them within nine inches of each other in the same room, and watched the, the, the pregnancy, the labor and the delivery, and the suffering that she went through. It was meaningful suffering. And so how do, you know, it's, it is that perspective. How can suffering become meaningful in, so, in someone's life is really what these psychedelic medicines are addressing. What, what we actually need is not a tensionless state, right, but rather the striving and struggling for some goal worthy, worthy of us. Um, Jung, Carl Jung talked about, you know, that tension of opposites. How can we hold a polarity, two opposites at the same time? Because we're a multiplicity, we frequently hold feelings that might be at odds with each other. How do we hold it all? How do we hold all those parts of who we are at the same time without narrowing our consciousness and making one at about one part, just blending with one part, one part, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, whether it's anger, whatever it is, how do we hold frequently with anger their sadness, right? How do we hold all those feelings at once? Even, you know, all of it. Um, and of course, you know, Viktor Frankl was in a concentration camp. He lost his wife. Um, and he kept on going. And he really observed and studied the people that made it through those concentration camps with maybe even some humor, right. unbelievably, right? So all of psych, uh, psychedelic medicine, um, the MDMA, the MAPS MDMA training, but psychedelic in medicine in, ge in general really emphasizes the innate healing capacity, which in naturopathy and homeopathy we talk about is vitalism, right? That, that inner doctor, that inner healer that we all have. And the innate healing capacity that we all have, the healing power of nature, right? Vis medicatrix, nature I. It's deep roots in Hippocrates, right? First do no harm, right? We've, we've lost that. Right? We've lost this belief in an innate healing capacity. It has to come from external to us now. But that's a setup for non-malfeasance and doing harm. You know, and I, I, I want to also hold the conventional medical system with some respect, too, because it does have its place. I don't want to, I don't, like, I don't want to throw it under the bus, although I feel like it sometimes. 
when I was working on psychiatric units, I worked up in Portland at the Crisis Triage Center. So we really saw very acute florid psychosis, people that had just made a suicide attempt and medically cleared and were under observation in our psychiatric unit. You know, when someone would come in floridly psychotic, not knowing top from bottom, you know, just having no sense of where they were, five milligrams of Haldol, two milligrams of Ativan, being able to have a lucid conversation within an hour. Oh my gosh, what a godsend, mm -hmm. right? It has its place in emergency medicine, especially. I mean, Andrew Weil says, if I'm in a car accident, don't take me to an herbalist, <laughs> right? So, but conventional medicine totally, you know, it, we need it. And thank goodness we have it. Um, I think it's overused. And I think it's used in places that cure is possible. We're palliating where cure is possible. Um, again, this innate healing capacity in naturopathy, we've got a saying, there will never be a cure for the common cold because the cold is the cure, right? All the symptoms that our body puts out to cure a virus, that is the cure. The snotty nose, the cough, the fever, you know? My seven-year-old daughter um, had a high fever a couple weeks ago, had a virus going on, and wow, Talia, your you're so amazing. Watch, your body is healing you right now. Or sometimes we'll watch a, a little scab or a cut heal, and watch, in a couple days, that's going to be gone. We don't even need to do anything. Your body is doing always exactly what it needs to do. How amazing is that? Your body's amazing. All of our bodies are amazing. So the innate healing capacity, these medicatrix nurturae, treat the whole person, another core naturopathic homeopathic principle. This taps into Dame Cicely Saunders, you know, the founder of, or the one who brought hospice medicine to the West, to Yale, I think 62 or 63. But she named the total pain concept a holistic nature of pain and the interplay of psychological and social well-being, spirituality, and culture. Symptoms rarely, they never occur, occur in isolation, right? They cluster with other symptoms that are influenced by the psychological, social, and cultural characteristics of the individual. Pain is multidimensional. We, as human beings, we suffer physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and socially. Mm -hmm. How often does medicine address all five of those at once, right? These are all connected, right? They're all connected. And, you know, psychedelic medicine also has this potential because it's not just this discursive prefrontal cortex addressing pain, addressing mental suffering, but we're able to touch into the spiritual realm. We're able to explore social suffering. We're able to explore mental, emotional, and physical pain, emotional pain. So it's not just physical pain we're talking about. We're talking about the whole person. So when I was talking earlier about the default mode network, on the left, this is a FMR, fMRI representation of people on psilocybin to the right, what their brain looks like in terms of interconnection, what it looks like on the left during the default mode network, right? This is normative consciousness. We're not using all of our brain, obviously. There are certain channels, certain connections that are well-worn. Um, you know, you could say ruts in some ways. Um, and on what it does, the psilocybin and the ketamine and uh, MDMA, is that it really opens up a lot of different neural pathways so that we can see the world, how to change the mind again. How do we open up to seeing ourselves, to connecting different experiences, different memories, different perceptions? How do we connect those in a different way? that can provide a potential for new meaning, a new way to look at ourselves in the world. Um, I don't have much to say about this, but you know, in, in homeopathy, there's a real emphasis on individualiz individualization of treatment, which I really think is so important. It's not a one-size-fits-all medicine. Just remember, you're totally unique, just like everyone else. 
Also, what is most personal is most universal. That's Carl Rogers. So, how am I doing on time? Um, good. Okay. So, I wanted to share, you know, I, um, the psilocybin studies that have been done at NYU, at Johns Hopkins, what uh, they used something called the Mystical Experience Questionnaire, which is based on William James's work uh, at the turn of last century. And these are the um, six qualities that are frequently associated uh, with psychedelic experiences. And what was so fast, and so the psilocybin studies that they were doing at Johns Hopkins and NYU were working with depression and anxiety amongst a terminally ill population. Okay? What was amazing about that study is that after one psilocybin experience, these people, a, a majority of these participants, were depression, anxiety free three months after that one experience, six months after one experience. And there was a correlation between how high someone rated on the mystical experience questionnaire and the remission of depression and anxiety. So I think it's, you know, the, the aspects of the mystical state, uh, mystical experience questionnaire, and they've got, you know, I think it's like 100 questions, um, and they're broken up into these six categories. A deeply felt positive mood, um, strong positive affect. This can range from peace, serenity, and tranquility to ecstatic rapture, not dis dissimilar from sexual orgasm of cosmic proportions. According... <laughs> To, uh, accounts of mystical experiences are also characterized by striking paradoxicality, right? Again, that tension of opposites, how do we hold that? Like, you know, the voice dialogue, right, which is the precursor to internal family systems. How do we remain in the ego-aware state with two polarities that might be opposing at the same time? without cheating towards this side or cheating towards that side? How do, we rec how do we stay in the middle, aware, conscious of these two parts that are in polarity with each other? Boy, I'm feeling angry and sad at the same time. I want to talk about each of those parts. This mono-mind theory that we're working on, by and large, does not work with the reality of how humans experience emotion we're frequently having conflicting emotions within us. How do we name each of those parts and give each due justice and due diligence? Ineffability. So frequently, and this happens all the time uh, with ketamine-assisted uh, psychotherapy, what we're doing, it's really hard for people to put some of their experiences into words. Right, some of these experiences are not discursive, prefrontal cortex, logical, rational, left brain. I'm gonna name this, and this is what it is. It is a felt state. And this is why, I mean, you know, ta um, you know, uh, so many things I wanna say. <laughs> um, um, this is a felt state, and the healing, you know, the MDMA studies, so they were comparing just talk therapy and a placebo with talk therapy, psychotherapy, and the MDMA on board, studying PTSD. 62% of the group, the cohort, that received talk therapy and MDMA, 62% were no longer diagnosable with PTSD. 30% um, were no longer diagnosable with the placebo and just talk therapy. And then another tw they captured another 22% um, who experienced considerable benefit from the MDMA and talk therapy. And I think what this alludes to is that talking prefrontal cortex, cognitive behavioral therapy for sure, 
gets us so far. But if we're really talking about healing, you got to feel it to heal it. And sometimes that healing experience cannot be described in words. It's ineffable. It has to be a felt sense. Um, transcendence of time and space. Five minutes can feel like five years, or five years can feel like five minutes. People, you can feel like you've lived a lifetime during a psychedelic journey. But it's really outside the usual confines of, of time and space. Unity. A sense of oneness and unity with other people, nature, and the entire universe is a necessary condition of cosmic consciousness. So, and deeply healing. Like, how, we're, we're in exile. We've chosen exile from this planet in the way that we're behaving. It's like we're separate. We've chosen to go into exile. How do we come back into connection with what is sustaining us, Gaia, Mother Earth? How do we come back into connection and unity with her? How do we respect and return home? How do we come home to who we are? How do we come home to ourselves, to our true nature? How do we come home to nature and what sustains us? So that sense of oneness and unity, I think, is deeply healing. I mean, if there's just that sense of meaningfulness and value and just connecting and living in accordance with nature and feeling unified with it, the noetic quality, there's an, you know, gnosis, like the Gnostics, like a direct knowing of things, which again often is ineffable. Often it's rooted in, in, in intuition. It sometimes is hard to describe or explain, but there's just a knowing that, that people frequently have during a psychedelic experience. Um, convinced that they are in touch with the deeper truth about the reality and the nature of existence, a state of knowing and insight into the depths of truth unplumbed by the discursive come with great authority. And sacredness, right? How do we come back to recognizing what is sacred? How do we connect with what is sacred? How does that guide our behavior? How does that guide what is meaningful and valuable in our lives? an experience of amazement, a sense of limit, limitations and smallness of our everyday personality in contrast to the infinite, a sense of profound humility before the majesty of what was felt to be sacred or holy, a sense of being at a spiritual height, a sense of reverence, right? Feeling that you experience something profoundly sacred and holy, a sense of awe or awesomeness. What is sacred? What is holy to you? How do we connect with it? How do we live from that place? So, trauma, that rupture in trust, right? That significant rupture in trust. Not everybody in this world is so fortunate to have had secure attachment with their family of origin. Right? And even if you did have that good fortune growing up, it doesn't take much trauma to totally sever that secure attachment. You know, how do we learn? How do we take that rupture in trust and recreate secure attachment with ourselves, with others, with the people we love? How do we feel safe and trusting again with the people we love? Right? So that, what I was speaking about earlier, where, you know, that vulnerability piece, allowing that psycholytic effect, allowing the ego defenses to come down, that restraint release, that defense release, here I am, vulnerable, in a therapeutic alliance with a provider who I can trust, who's going to be with me, who is present, who is compassionate, who is non-judgmental, how can we de redevelop that secure attachment with people again? And I think on some basic level, this is what most therapy is about. It's about recreating secure attachment 
And the, the therapeutic relationship is a proxy for people to practice and then take that out into the world again with, their, with their, all their relations. Trauma is not what happens to us, but what we hold inside in the absence of an em empathic witness. You know, um, I like to quote Oprah Winfrey <laughs> when she says, who I think of as kind of a guru, it's not what happened don't ask what happened, what's wrong with you, ask what happened, right? What happened to you? Um, and frequently trauma is trauma because no one else, there wasn't a witness to your suffering. And so the memory of that is questioned. The, the understand, the, did that happen? Did that not happen? Was I at fault? Was I not at fault? You know, and so having a therapeutic relationship where there is an empathic witness to what you experienced, I think is also part of what recovers people from PTSD. You know, how do you, how do you heal from that? So psychedelic assisted therapy, Pat, is non-pathologizing. I love it that the MAPS MDMA protocol has, I mean, they're using the DSM-5 but they've also kind of chucked it out the window because that pathologizing model that we use in medicine where somebody comes in and a doctor says, you are depressed. <laughs> like the person's a walking ball of depression or something. Like again, that mono mind theory at work with labeling somebody and diagnosing somebody and pathologizing somebody, they're not a walking ball of depression. There's a part of them that's depressed. It's not their whole being, right? So that's a significant difference in therapeutic lens that we're bringing and that the psychedelic medicine renaissance is bringing. It's non-pathologizing. And I'll, I'll, yeah, and I'll just talk about this in just a bit. I, I gotta speed things up. Coming home to self, moving from separation and disconnection into wholeness and trust again. Right, that experience of wholeness and integrity. How do we integrate trauma? Experience of suffering and anguish, of separation and wounding, of isolation. Healing is returning to wholeness from fragmentation, moving from separation to connection. Um, a sense of connection to self, others, phenomenal world, ultimate meaning, sense of meaning in the context of suffering, capacity to find peace in the present moment, finding peace in the eye of the storm, experience of sympathetic non-adversarial connection to the disease process, right? Cancer, when we go to war with cancer, we're going to war with ourselves on some level, and there's a ton of collateral damage. That doesn't mean that chemotherapy and radiation don't, when surgery don't work and don't have a place, but it's good to keep in mind that the cancer is our own cells, and that when we go to battle with ourselves, we're wounded and there's collateral damage in the process. Ultimately, if I was to say there's an end game to psychedelic medicine, it's experiential and emotional flexibility. Consciousness is vast. When we're blended with a part that is depressed, a part that is anxious, a part that's experienced trauma, our consciousness narrows. We're blended with that part. And, and I'll just do a quick little exercise with you that I learned. Um, there was a Tibetan Buddhist, uh, Mingo Rinpoche, who came to Medford about a month ago. He gave a great talk. And he did this really fun exercise that I invite you all to do with me. He said, cover one eye with one hand, hold your thumb out like you're an artist, and bring that thumb in until it's about an inch from your eye. Look up, look to the right, look to the left, look down. What did you see? <laughs> your thumb. 
And meanwhile, while you were looking at your thumb, you know, I saw these two fine people over here. Nikki and Ray and that plant in the books in the ceiling. There's all this happening at the exact same time. Consciousness is vast. When we blend with that thumb, which is, I think, what is an apt metaphor for depression, for anxiety, when we're blended with the depression, that part, we see the world through those depressed lenses, that depressed lens. It's not the whole of the story. It's not the whole of who we are, what we can potentially perceive. But it does obscure our consciousness. And we see the world through that lens. So, internal family systems is sweeping the psychedelic medicine field right now. Um, Richard Schwartz is the uh, originator of it. Um, Internal family systems, Marsha Linehan's dialectical behavioral therapy, and Stephen Hay's ACT, acceptance commitment therapy. These are considered the third wave of CBT. They're all rooted in mindfulness, is what they share. IFS, you know, it's, it's a little bit of an old wine in a new bottle. It goes back to voice dialogue. It goes back to Carl Jung. It goes back to Freud. It goes back to that battle between Dionysus and Apollo, <laughs> right? A lot of parts going on in the human psyche. But I love the way that Schwartz lays it out because um, it really dovetails beautifully with psychedelic medicine. His idea, uh, first and foremost, is that, like I've been speaking to, we're not a mono mind. We're a multiplicity. We have different parts in us. This room is very full. My parts alone, <laughs> you know, right? We're all in this together, but lots of parts. We also each have a self, capital S self, he talks about. There are some, you know, spiritual connotations or associations with this, you know, whether it's Buddha nature, Atman, there are those linkages. But there's a capital S self in each of us. When we've been traumatized, we want to make that trauma, we send it into exile, right? We send it into the unconscious, we send it into shadow, we sweep it under the carpet, it's too painful to hold. Especially for a child who's experienced sexual trauma, physical trauma, a five-year-old cannot hold trauma, so they fragment. They push that exile down. They compensate with other parts that serve them, maybe in their entire lifetime. But at some point, they do wear out their welcome, and ultimately, they don't heal that exile. But when that exile is too painful to feel, we need to fragment. Consciousness is wise in its ability to, to fragment to a degree. And in that moment, there needs to be some dissociation. There needs to be some aversion. There needs to be a way to just deal and live. And, you know, on this note, you know, I'd like to, in evolutionary biology, they say, you know, we're wired for survival. We're not wired for well-being. We're just mammals here trying to survive another day. And so with trauma and fragmentation and suffering, we're trying to survive and do the best we can given life circumstance. So the exile, we're trying to keep it down out of consciousness. And we do that with managers and firefighters. Protectors is kind of the catch all for that. And let me go to this one. And so the managers, the protectors, are proactive. They're vigilant. You know, and they prevent the exiles from being triggered and flooding the internal system with emotion. We want to keep those exiles in exile. So we do this with workaholism. We do this, the inner critic does this. People pleasing does this. Caretaking does this. Dissociating, somaticizing 
intimacy, food, substance, spiritual bypass does this. They are compensatory in that they protect us from experiencing the exiles. When the managers get overwhelmed, the firefighters come on the scene. And those can be cutting. Those can be getting drunk. Those can be shooting up with heroin. They are emergency response workers attempting to put out the fire of the pain, right? Alcohol and drug abuse, suicidal ideation, binge eating, excessive shopping, cutting, promiscuity, even homicide. These are ways that we compensate to not feel what's real in us. Fortunately, we all contain within us a capital S self. Uh, in voice dialogue, the aware ego process. The qualities of the capital S self are that, and how do we know we're in self? When we're curious about ourselves and others. When we're compassionate towards ourselves and others. When we feel courage, when we feel confidence, when there's clarity on board, when there's creativity on board. Um, what are the other ones? When we're feeling connected and when we're feeling calm. Even when we have two or three of those on board, <laughs> everything goes better, right? We relate to ourselves better. We can relate to our parts. So when we're in self and my dystymic part comes up and I'm in two or three of the C words, Say I'm feeling curious and compassionate, maybe confident or created or connected. I'm able to look at that dystymic, that depressed part that comes up in me. I'm able to look at it. It's not what's wrong with you, Ian. What happened? What is that depressed part trying to tell me? What's it trying to teach me? What's underlying that? What's the root cause of that? How can I hold myself and my sadness, my eco-anxiety, how can I hold it in a loving place like I would my two-year-old when she trips and stumbles and falls face down or she's having a tantrum? I don't say, what's wrong with you? Violet, what happened? I take her into my arms. I hold her. How can we do that for ourselves, right? How do we take in that two-year-old that we each have, bring in that self-love, bring in that self-compassion, bring in that curiosity, bring in that, bring in that compassion to ourselves, because that's ultimately where it starts. And when we can do that for ourselves, we can do it for others, right? You know, the, the other thing that I want to say about parts um, is that the IFS methodology works great, and I found this just spontaneously, but it works great with mediation work <laughs> between parties that are conflicting, right? Because if you've got two people that are at odds with each other, it's typically their parts that are at odds with each other. So if you've got two people and you can talk about their parts, because it's not all of them, it's not all of Bill here, it's a part of Bill, there's less of it being personal then, right? It's a part of me. A part of me is feeling this way about you, right? That's a much different thing than saying, I feel this way about you. Like all of me, 100%. From the top of my head to my bottom of my feet feels this way. No. You know, a lot of feelings happening, lots of parts happening. So trauma, again, it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. So how, does tra how is trauma manifested? All these parts, how do these parts come into existence? The insomnia, the flashbacks, the intrusive memories, the hypervigilance, the substance abuse, the eating disorders. These aren't, you know, 
we've got to stop treating the symptoms and we've got to get to the root cause. In many ways, all of these parts are adaptations to deal with the trauma, that exile. How do we deal with the depression? How do we deal with the dissociation, the self-destructive behavior? You know, in our conventional medical approach, we're treating this, the sequelae of the trauma. We're not addressing the trauma, right? And so through IFSIs, you can take almost any diagnosis in the DSM-5 and pop the symptom criteria into, these are managers, this is the exile, these are firefighters, right? Emotional numbing and withdrawal in PTSD. You know, firefighting, I don't want to feel that pain. I don't want to feel that suffering. The intrusive re-experiencing of traumatic experiences memories, nightmares, flashbacks. These are the exiles emerging. In some ways, in the body's wisdom, it's giving us an opportunity to heal. But what do we do? We suppress, right? We suppress all of those experiences with benzodiazepines, with antidepressants, with self-medication, with alcohol, with heroin, whatever it is. You know, I, I just, I want to share this one story just because it was so powerful. One of the videos that they showed during the MAPS MDMA um, you know, and I, I um, yeah, I mean, this, this, this participant who went through the process um, watched her husband get hit by a car. And, you know, and they had a, a one-year-old. And during her MDMA session, she had a flashback where she was vividly re-experiencing watching her husband get flipped in the air before he died. So while on the MDMA, she re-experienced this without being re-triggered by it. And she tuned into the memory. And she said, wow, the sun was shining at that moment. The crickets were chirping. All of these things were happening. Life was happening while that death was happening. That was enormously healing for her to be able to memory reconsolidate with that trauma and recognize everything around her that life was still happening. She did extremely well and is no longer diagnosable with, with PTSD. I'm always a little hesitant to, say, to talk about that, but you know, they were talking about trauma, and I think that, you know. Yeah, and I, what a blessing that she was able to share her experience as a teaching kind of thing because it really brings it home. Schwartz also talks about family legacy like, and societal burdens both. Um, someone's in a state of suffering. Their parents, their parents' parents, their parents' parents' parents, seven generations, right? Sexual abuse, physical abuse. It frequently, there's a lineage, a family legacy that comes down generation after generation after generation that's reenacted, right? We know this. I think that's a good thing for people to remember that it's not just them, right? They come from somewhere and that lineage is strong. And at what point does somebody who's been abused say, I, the buck stops here. I'm not going to continue this with my own children. You know, how does that happen? Because the tendency is to reenact, right? We know this. We're also dealing with the, with the societal burdens of racism that affects everybody, sexism 
that impacts negatively everybody. Rampant individualism and capitalism that hurts everybody. The patriarchy that hurts everybody. So self as context, it's not just the individual with some serotonin and dopamine tweaking that we need to take care of. We also need to think about the context, the society, the culture, what's going on, if we're really going to talk about healing, right? We need to understand the context of where someone comes from and what's facilitating and per perpetuating some of these feedback loops. You know, we're all disconnected and on our own in this dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? That's going to impact someone's depression, that depressed part. Success is for the successful, so pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Boy, that's great fodder for the self-critic, right? How to, how to bring us down, right? But this is messaging that we get all the time. Um, so Stephen Hayes, you know, how do we look at our parts rather than through our parts? How do we look at the depressed part, the anxious part, the traumatized part, rather than through that part? One of the things that comes on really strongly during a ketamine experience is the self-witness. There's still very much a self on board. So you're, rec you're not, we're not sending people, we're not dose matters again, but we're not sending people so far that they lose self. And definitely dose matters with a lot of these medicines. I mean, it's, it's quite easy to, you know, at three or 400 micrograms of LSD, it really is possible to totally obliterate yourself, right? And it just dissolves. You know, and I, maybe there's some merit in that experience, but what really matters after any experience, psychedelic experience, is where, how do we bring it home? How do we make it durable? How do we sustain it? How do we really ground it? And so in my practice, I frequently tell people, you know, the actual psychedelic experience, 15, 20% of this whole thing what really matters is your preparation and your integration. And it really leans heavily into the integration. Because how do we ground this experience? If we don't ground it into daily life, into the meaning making, it's just another experience. It doesn't matter how big the epiphany is. It doesn't matter the aha moment and how big it is. You know, it's easy to have a huge experience on LSD but afterwards, you know, after the cushion, then the dishes, right? We go to the mountaintop, receive this revelation, but when we come back down to the valley and the dog runs away, we get into a fight with our spouse, right? We're at odds with somebody. How do we really use that experience that we just had on the mountaintop to interact with real life? You know, I like to say... Um, you know, to a lot of what I'm saying is, of course, pretty Buddhisty philosophy, but <laughs> Buddhist psychology. Um, but you know, drawing water, chopping wood, psychedelics, drawing water, chopping wood. Right? It's the same stuff. It's the perception. It's how. It's the experiential flexibility. It's the emotional flexibility. When we come back down to our normative consciousness after a psychedelic journey, how do we integrate that into our daily life, into the the day-to-day -day frustrations and tensions and and angst and existential dread that we all feel, or I feel, and doing the dishes? <laughs> right, our dishwasher has been broken five years now, so I know all about the dishes. And that discussion that happens at the end of the night when my wife is tired and I'm tired, who's going to do the dishes? So I want to, um, oh good, 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 okay. So I want to share a little bit about, you know, how 
how I do things with ketamine assisted psychotherapy and um, how I've been trained and what's been working for us. And I want to say that it's not just solely me that's doing this. Um, it is a gestalt of the medicine, of the psychotherapist on my team, because we're truly doing integrative medicine with this. There are some medical concerns with ketamine. It does elevate blood pressure. Um, there's certain medications that really are contraindicated with ketamine. So there's a whole medical piece. There's a physical piece. And there's a psychological piece. And so, you know, it's, it's, I love it. I love the work that I'm doing. I love working with a psychotherapist on my team. I love both of us putting our heads together. This is the medical aspect. This is the psychological aspect. This is the spiritual aspect. This is the social aspect. All of it. And to have a, a coworker, a teammate, that we are working together. And each patient, we do a preparatory session where I'll meet, with, uh, I'll meet with the person for the first hour and 15 minutes, and then Martha meets with them for another hour. And you know, we, we talk about their terrain, we, about what they're dealing with, what parts are up for them, what parts they want to work on, what is the inquiry, what is the intention, what are they wanting to explore? What are they wanting to work on? You know, knowing on some level that it's totally unpredictable what kind of a psychedelic experience someone's going to have, because everyone's totally different. And, but again, there's that trust in the innate healing capacity that whatever comes up for somebody during a psychedelic experience, their body is, isn't just whimsically throwing things up from our consciousness, but it's, there's some self-healing orientation that's helping with that. Even challenging experiences, right? In the field, we say there's, there's no bad trips. There's only challenging experiences. And I would take that one step further, and I speak from personal experiences, my own psychedelic experiences that have been most deeply healing have been the hardest ones, right? The parts where I died, the parts where I re was reborn, right? Terrifying, terrifying, and the most healing. Some of the most ex healing experiences of my life have been the most difficult ones with psychedelics. Um, but we never really know, you know. <laughs> Ketamine in general, um, people, there tends to be a sense of, a deep sense of okayedness, a deep sense of peace that comes up, a self-witness that is strong, that can look at the parts without being triggered by them. Um, unlike what can happen on LSD and sometimes psilocybin. People that ha have yet to see somebody, and I've done about 100 sessions with people so far. We only opened up in October. But I've sat with about 100 people uh, with ketamine. And no one's gone into a panic attack. Um, I take that back. One person with a severe anxiety disorder did go into a panic attack, and it was fascinating because they we're watching it happen, happening, and they said, wow, my heart's not racing. Wow, I'm not perspiring. Wow, I'm not freaking out right now. And yet, I'm observing this panic attack happening. You know, again, that, yeah, symptoms. And again, it's like, you know, it's again what, what the MDMA is, you know, how can we look squarely at this part that has panic attacks without being physiologically triggered, that survival limbic system mechanism that puts out symptoms? How can we just look at that experience and have a self-witness on board that just is observing that and feeling it 
but observing it. And this patient is off of Ativan now. Hasn't used it for a month and was taking it regularly up till then. You know, um, you know, on that note, we've had three clients, one whose intention was to stop drinking, heavy drinker, and has been sober five months now. And another two clients that were heavy alcohol users, but the main thing that they came in for was depression. The ketamine addressed their depression. They spontaneously stopped using alcohol, right? So, um, right, assessing. So that first preparatory session is really important, assessing psychological medical concerns, um, any history of heart attack or stroke. Ketamine, on average, raises systolic blood pressure 15 to 20 points. So if someone has uncontrolled hypertension, you've got to be cautious with that. I don't want to give ketamine to anybody who comes in with a blood pressure of, you know, 160 over 95, too risky, right? Um, sometimes I'll use clonidine to temporarily bring down the blood pressure. But I found actually, um, I do a little meditation uh, with people that has brought down blood pressure by more points than just the clonidine, <laughs> right? Um, and so, you know, and it can raise di uh, diastolic blood pressure for t by 10 points, the second number in the blood pressure uh, assessment. So, you know, we, we rule out schizophrenia or other thought disorders. Um, you know, when someone is bipolar and might be trending towards a mania, I don't want to give them ketamine, right? Although if someone's bipolar and they're in their depression, I feel safer giving ketamine at that point. I find this totally fascinating. Um, but there I met when I was at the MDMA training, this PhD who's down at the VA in San Diego working with veterans with psychosis. They're doing a study on giving veterans with psychosis DMT. Again, like cures like, right? <laughs> Rather than repressing that symptom, what's happening there when you give someone what they used to call a psychomimetic, right? Something that, that mimics psychosis to a psychotic person. You know, in the 50s they were doing, and this is in Michael Pollan's book, but they were doing um, research in Canada with schizophrenics. Um, at first, the psychiatrists were taking the LSD themselves. <laughs> to see if they could have some relational, could understand more what the mind of a uh, schizophrenic was like. Um, it didn't work out great, but, um, you know, um, I wanna, Nikki, could you, could you help me get some water? Is that okay? Thank you so much. You know, and, and I, I wanted to say something on that note that it just reminded me of, and I wanted to say this at the beginning of this talk is that I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for the underground psychedelic therapists. They've been carrying the torch for the last 50 years, right? Not all of them are great. Not all of them understand boundary violations, right? Thank you so much. You know, not all of them are accountable to a board, obviously, like I am, right? But a lot of them have been doing exceptional work and risking, you know, their livelihoods at risk of going to jail, you know, because of, of Nixon shutting everything down in the early 71. And so I want to, you know, I want to honor the, the, the underground therapists in this town and nationwide and all over the world because they've been carrying the torch for the last 50 years. And, you know, here I am, because I'm above ground, 
because of the, you know, being able to speak about this, which is totally, like, I'm still pinching myself even that I'm just giving this talk right now, and I'm talking about my own psychedelic experiences, and that there is a permissiveness right now that we can talk about these things, because that hasn't been the case for so many years. One of the super cool things about psychedelic therapy is that providers are really expected to have experienced the medicine themselves, right? I didn't start offering ketamine-assisted psychotherapy until I had gone through the own process myself with a couple doctors, one down here, one up in Portland. But I've experienced this firsthand, and I know what that state is like. And so I can speak to it from direct experience. I wish... I wish that all psychiatrists would have some experience with the psychotropics they use with patients before they administer them to others. So they really knew what Risperidol felt like. So they really knew what Seroquel felt like. So they really knew what it felt like to try to get off of Ativan or Xanax. You know, they pass it out like no big deal. It is a big deal, you know, and first do no harm. <laughs> We're much more motivated to do no harm if we know what the harm feels like firsthand, right? Um, and there are a lot of great psychiatrists <laughs> too, you know, in this valley, you know. I, w I wish Rod Burney hadn't moved to, <laughs> <laughs> to Portland, I love that guy. Ted Sundin, you know, there's some great psychiatrists in this valley that I adore um, and are doing good work, right? Um, yeah, and there's probably others I haven't mentioned that I'm sorry if I haven't mentioned you, but those are the two that I've been closest with and, and adore. And um, I know that they're not typical psychiatrists. <laughs> they're bringing a lot of other things into it too. Um, so during the, the preparatory session, I talk about the IFS framework. I often give people homework. Uh, Richard Schwartz has a great book. It's called No Bad Parts, right? Because there are no bad parts. It's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. These parts came into existence for a reason. They're trying to help you on some level. You know, even severe, severe depression, you know, is on some level a protective mechanism to prevent us from suicide, on some level. If we're too depressed to get out of bed, it's hard to kill ourselves, right? Um, IFS has also given me in easier, so it's, it's made it easier for me to talk about suicidal ideation with patients, right? Because when I was trained, like, oh my gosh, this person's suicidal. <laughs> red, red flags, triggers, got to protect my butt, you know. And it's like IFS, suicidal ideation is a part. It's a protector in some, on some way, it's like, oh, I could just end this, is a way to deal with the extreme suffering and pain, just holding that thought. You don't need to act on it, but it's a protector in some ways of managing the exile, the suffering that's intense. Um, you know, I also... Um, the other thing I wanted to say about that was that pretty much a month into doing this work, and the nature of ketamine is that people with severe depression are coming to me, people with severe anxiety are coming to me, people with trauma, and people who are suicidal, right? About 15%, I would say, of my current patient load, they're having suicidal thoughts weekly. I realized really early on that I needed to get back into psychotherapy myself. 
if I was going to hold this, right? Because I was coming home, I was thinking about these, these clients, I was worrying about them, I was falling asleep thinking about them. I'm like, I need to get some help myself to hold this and to f create a container for this. I'm not going to be able to do this on my own. And fortunately, I, you know, I, I found a great psychotherapist that has talked with her today. Um, boy, it's like doing this work, doing my own work, you know, it's like, what a blessing. Um, I don't, I, I realize now, like, there's no way I could do this work without being in therapy myself. No way. Right? Um, no food, no fluids. You know, one of the things about ketamine is that nausea can happen. Um, and, you know, we don't want anyone vomiting during a session. Um, we don't really take people so far into, excuse me, into a state of sedation or, you know, an anesthesia that vomiting could really be an asphyxiation risk. But I just want to, you know, due diligence and be safe. Obviously, no alcohol 24 hours before the session. Um, and you can't drive after a ketamine experience. Um, sailor legs, you know, there's a little bit of wobbliness. So people need to get a ride to and from the medicine session. I also tell people, you know, no chainsaw work. <laughs> don't, don't get your backhoe out and do any heavy machinery work. Um, don't move to, you know, get up and move to Arkansas or Tennessee or Oklahoma. I mean, nothing about those places, but don't make any rash, huge decisions after a psychedelic experience. Just let it sit, you know, let it marinate with you, right? Um, and the other part to that is um, I like to say, you know, don't prematurely foreclose on meaning. Sometimes a psychedelic experience can provide material for self-understanding that can go on for a lifetime. One psychedelic experience can be a, a lifetime of experience to digest. It could be three months, it could be six months. Frequently with ketamine, usually, you know, two or three day point, that's when some of the epiphany and aha moments happen, actually. It takes a little time for the experience to digest. And this actually guides me. I, I definitely am one who um, less is more, which is something I get from homeopathy. It's also true of psychedelics that if you've had a psychedelic experience that's really big and you're still processing the material that arose, you don't need to have another psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and you know, and it, it worries me a little bit about, um, you know, the ayahuasca scene um, where people are having numerous experiences in a short period of time and there's not a lot of integration that happens after that. That worries me a little bit, you know. I think there's a double edge to psychedelics. It can be very fragmenting it also can be very integrating. It's all how it's held, it's all how it's integrated afterwards. But I've had, you know, more than five, seven conversations with people who have talked about their ayahuasca experience and they have no idea how to integrate any of it. Just a humongous experience that blew their mind and they're like, I don't know what the heck to do with this right now. I have no support to integrate that. You know, and there's also an element, I'm also almost a little hesitant to, to name this, but there's also an appropriation aspect, a little bit with psilocybin, with ayahuasca, with peyote. These aren't of the Western tradition. In some ways, I feel much more comfortable offering ketamine for that reason, I feel more comfortable offering MDMA. It, when LSD becomes legal, it's like, yeah, 
this is West Coast. <laughs> this is where I'm at, right? This is, you know, this grew, Albert Hoffman, I mean, this grew out of Western thinking and Western culture and ethos. You know, it's, I'm not a shaman, you know? I don't, <laughs> and there is a little bit of that appropriation that's happening with ayahuasca being used pretty widely in Ashland. And people have some great experiences and, you know, and, and I think people are finding some healing and, and do have a lot of insight. Um, but it's, again, it's not what you use, it's how you use it. And it is the setting and the context, and it is the integration and preparation. I just think that this model that I'm describing here for moving forward with psychedelics and Western culture, this feels more part and parcel of what Western culture and the ethos, what we're about um, within a psychiatric, psychological, Western understanding of healing and wellness and cure. Yeah, and I, you know, and I, I'm not saying, I don't worry, I really don't want this to come across as me dissing any of that because I think that there's great merit in the ayahuasca scene. I think that psilocybin is really going to help a lot of people when it comes online. Um, but it's also, I think we need to recognize, you know, the Mazatec, and there's a tradition of psilocybin and how it's been used for centuries. And the drug war does go back to the conquistadores coming and shutting that down 600 years ago. You know, that's when it started. Um, but there is a context to the use of those medicines that I don't think that we fully grok, nor appreciate, nor are bringing with the medicine. And that's why it's not what you use, it's how you use it, you know, in that the context is different here. Um, uh, music, so the only way past is through that which you resist persists. I think that, that is a, that's an aphorism for psychedelic medicine that holds true, that the more we're resisting our parts, right, the stronger they become, we, a restraint release, right? We can't, we can't push them away. We can't dissociate from them. We cannot collapse into them. Attachment, aversion, ignorance. How do we rest in awareness with our parts? How do we rest in that aware ego process, holding all of this multiplicity of parts at the same time? Um, how do we, you know, I like to quote Frank Otisaki, the hospice worker, you know, love is not a gated community. This is true of parts. We've got to learn that the parts are there for a reason. Ultimately, how can we come into relationship with those parts? How can we love those parts? Thank you for protecting me. Thank you for coming into my consciousness and awareness because you've been serving me all these years. You know, it's a very different restraint release model than suppressing those symptoms. Music is really important. Um, music is emotion. You know, it's, it's easier for people to keep on moving through a psychedelic experience with the music. It's, a, it's like a river, it's like water, it's like movement that helps people move through difficult experiences during a psychedelic journey. So the day of the medicine session, um, no food, no drink, blood pressure, review intentions, inquiries. I, I check in with the parts. Because if there's a part that's not really on board, that's going to become a problem during the session. So I talk to people about checking in with their parts. Okay, can you trust my capital S self enough to go on this journey and come along with me? Right? Because the parts are trying to protect. They just want to protect. And the letting go, that psycholytic effect, can be very scary for the parts. 
So making sure that they're on board. Um, I really emphasize with my patients, you are safe. I am here maintaining safety. We are a present, contained environment that's non-judgmental, compassionate. I'm going to be with you the entire time. You will not be left alone during your experience. I am right here. Trauma happens in relationship. Healing also happens in relationship. And again, that relationship is so important for somebody to feel safe, um, that they feel that someone is present with them during their experience. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting with the MDMA therapy, they, they're really emphasizing touch, right? Which for years in the realm of psychology and psychi psychiatry, touch has been forbidden. You're not even supposed to hug your patients, right? You know, and it's a little extreme. And the way that, in, and touch is a really tricky thing. It needs to be, you know, we offer to hold hands. It's consensual. The client, you know, they initiate it. Agency is really important, right? It always has to be driven by the person. It has to be consensual. It has to, they have to, I say, okay, let's, you know, we can practice this, but if you want a held hand, hold out your hand and let me know. Um, but sometimes, you know, that, that can ground people and can help people feel more safe just to have that relationship present with them. Hand on the foot, you know. Um, eye masks are a, a part of the psychedelic field, mainly to keep it an inside job, inside journey. Visual consciousness is so, it's easy to come out of ourselves with our visual consciousness, right? So we keep the journey internal. Um, I often read a poem beforehand, try to, you know, figure out a good dose uh, of ketamine to give. Often I'll check in at the 15 minute point and ask if, if they're wanting to have a deeper experience. Um, so, you know, the medicine sessions last three hours. Oops, excuse me. Medicine sessions last three hours. The first hour we spend checking in with parts, uh, reviewing the intention, the inquiry, um, and the journey on ketamine lasts between 45 minutes to an hour. It's a relatively short journey. And then the last hour, um, my psychotherapist Martha comes in and the integration work starts at that point. And that's a really precious time when someone is returning to their normative consciousness after a psychedelic experience. Because you watch the parts come back online and you kind of watch them. Wow, there's me, there's part of me coming back, there's part of me coming back. And it's a great opportunity to self-witness, to witness the parts coming back online. And what, what is this Ian-ness of multiplicity, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, we, we, so when someone is, uh, after a journey, you know, we, you know, in addition to not chainsawing, backhoe work, moving to Timbuktu the day after, um, recognizing that people will frequently be in a more raw, vulnerable place, that they should, you know, be, um, discerning about who they're spending time with, what kinds of conversations to have. You know, just be vigilant about people might not understand what you experienced. Again, it's ineffable frequently. And there's still, you know, those lingering residues of the, the war on drugs. So people don't always have, they're like, you did what? Yeah. <laughs> right? You took what? Right? And that, you know, can be dissonant for someone who's just had a really deeply psychedelic experience to have their community, the people around them, questioning that experience. So being vigilant, being discerning about who do you share this experience with, right? 
and remain aware of parts as they return to normative consciousness. Um, let's see. I want to say, yeah, I want to save some time for questions. Um, there's a lot here, though. You know, integration challenges. Um, I think a lot about transference and countertransference during the psychedelic states because it, you know, have. I mean, the the transference in particular comes quite strongly, um, and I'm very aware when Martha and I are sitting with somebody at the same time, that we get the mother-father transference quite strongly. And, you know, there is, um, how, does, how do you convert that into a corrective healing experience? Recognizing that it's happening, recognizing that people frequently project father onto me, you know, how do I be aware of my own countertransference when that happens? Um, and how do I transform that transference into something that's healing? Um, this, you know, so, you know, erotic transference as well. This is why in many, this is why it, this coming above ground, you know, this is a concern with the underground movement is that I don't think that there's as much awareness about erotic transference and what that means. And there is a danger in that in boundary violations. Even people that are fully trained professionals that are really aware of how that happens. This happened with the MDMA trials, unbelievably, up in Canada where one of the physicians became sexually involved with a patient. You know, that has really blown up. Um, it happened with um, Francois Bourgeois, uh, French, um, what's her last name? Uh, Bourgeois, I want to say Bourgeois, but it's, uh, I forget her last name. Um, you know, there's a group that has been doing psil psilocybin training that's coming above board, but they had a huge thing where, where she and her husband, uh, her own, were a lot of boundary violations were happening underground, you know? Again, these experiences can be extremely fragmenting, if not re-traumatizing, if we're not very aware of boundary violations, very aware of the, of the counter-transference, of the transference, erotic transference and counter-transference. You know, statistically, not even in the realm of psychedelic medicine, Eight to 10% of male providers will become sexually involved with patients at some point in their careers. Three to 4% of female providers become involved. That risk and need for awareness is amplified. I mean, especially with MDMA, obviously, but you've really got to be aware and well-trained and accountable um, and in some ways, you know, having two providers in the room at the same time is protective. You know, also, you know, people with histories of sexual trauma, they go into psychedelic states, there's a lot that can be projected from that state. You've really got to be careful and cautious and really got to be aware. Um, anyway, my, my hope and prayer for this emerging psilocybin field is that there is significant training that goes into how to avoid boundary violations and to be aware of that. Because as you all may know, you know, you don't need a degree. The, the way that they've done the measure 109, you need a GED. You need a high school education, you, d you know? And they've done that with the intention of inclusivity right? Because if you've got to a postgraduate level, likely, you know, you're white and likely you've had the economic resources and educational background to get to where you're at. And that excludes a lot of people. And, you know, that training and to be accountable to a board is important for this. It's incredibly important. And so 
With the excitement of this emerging field, it's important to establish ethical clinical boundaries. And there's Hidden Springs. Yeah. All right. I don't know what happened to the color on that. It's, it's greener than usual. But, you know, I, like I was alluding to earlier, you know, it's not just me and Martha and, not, and the ketamine. It's, it's this land, right? It's the setting. Every morning when I come into work, and I am so grateful to Rod and Brooks for allowing us to do this work, and not only allowing us, but just being super supportive with the whole thing. Rod's been awesome, so is Brooks. But every morning I get to work, I go out to the pond, which isn't full right now, but I say a little prayer to the land, the divas and the devis, the spirits, the sky, the earth, Grizzly Peak, the water, the oaks, everything on that land. I enlist you, please help us do this healing work on this land. Please be allies for us. You know, that connection is as important as anything we're doing. So it really is that gestalt of set and setting providers, the medicine, it's not just the medicine, it's not just the providers, it's everything. It's, it's our front desk staff, um, Karen, who's very involved with Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library here, um, Karen Molesky. The, she's the first person that people see when they come into the office and she's awesome. Her voice is great on the phone. She's just, she's a healer, she's part of this. It's, it's the larger gestalt of what's happening. Yeah. So there's the, the hidden spring image, right? And, and coming up from the source, raising up and connecting. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, thank you for being here. Yeah. yeah.